SJC 11641, Stephen P. Abdow and others, the Attorney General and another. All right, let's proceed. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. My, may it please the court, my name is Thomas Bean with my co-counsel, Reed Witherby. We have the privilege of representing 10 individuals who have proposed an initiative petition that has been signed by over 70,000 voters in this Commonwealth that would make three forms of for-profit gambling illegal. Mr. Bean, do you agree that we need to consider the certifiability of this question in light of what the Gaming Commission has already done? That is, it has already issued a license. Yes. So that is an important part of us, regardless of what the Attorney General says with respect to the process. Yes. I mean, we do think, as we talk about at length in our brief, that the, and, and as the Attorney General agrees, that the Commonwealth's police and regulatory powers would permit this law to pass, notwithstanding any claims that the interveners may have to, to the license. Or so a five-year exclusive license that has already been awarded after a thorough process as outlined by the legislature at great cost to the applicants can simply be taken away with a big never mind. Yes, and in, in Stone versus Mississippi, it was a 25-year charter that was granted to a lottery licensee. And the Supreme Court said that the state does not have the authority to contract away the state's police and regulatory powers. Well, and the police powers are limited the police powers don't trump the Constitution. You can't say, well, we have police powers, therefore we're going to take contract rights away without compensation because we have police powers. If there were a contract, that would be true. There's no contract There here? is no this contract. This license is not a contract? No, it is not. Huh. The Supreme Court said in Stone that before we even get to the question of whether there's a taking, we have to consider whether there is a contract. And the Supreme Court said in Stone that there is no contract. And this court said in the 1960 opinion of the justices that where the state seeks to waive or contract away the state's, state's core police and regulatory powers, any such contract purporting to do otherwise is invalid. So, so your position, well, is that police powers means a lot of different things and this is at one extreme end, gambling, I mean, and, and the ability, it's at the center of that core, whereas uh, where you place the elevated station is, is at the other end. That's precisely and, right. And, and it has nothing to do with one being a contract that's actually, uh, or, or, or an explicit allowance in the statute versus what you would say is not a contract. The I fact of a contract doesn't matter to you. Well, we think there isn't, the contract is invalid because of the police powers. This court in Boston Elevated distinguished between those police powers that are at the core, what the cult called the narrower signification, and the police powers that were comprehensive, that were much broader. We don't have to get to the hard question of, is this close to the line? The 1960 opinion said, placing that line between the narrower signification and things that did not fall within the core of police powers was sometimes difficult. But there's no question here. We have over 100 years of this court's jurisprudence that gambling lies at the core of, this, of the Commonwealth's police powers. Now, am, am, I, am I correct that a legislature could, if it was concerned about the willingness of, say, casinos to come forward with the, the, the investment necessary without some assurance that it would be allowed to proceed could declare it to be a contract? Uh, n it could declare it to be a contract with respect to matters that are not at the core. So you're saying no? I'm saying no, no. not for matters. If, for example, if the state, I, I don't, this is, if you get into matters of finance, okay, that are not at the core, uh, you may get into a closer question, but the answer is no. Under no circumstances, and this, as I said, we're we've got a lot of settled law from the Supreme Court and this court. 
when we are dealing with the core of the police regulatory powers, the state may not contract away its authority to protect the public welfare. I mean, I realize that. Oh, so may be even difficult. even if it were to turn out that no, that they were to have a gambling law and nobody were to come because nobody wanted to make the investment without some assurance, you're saying the legislature is powerless to say we will give you that assurance? When it comes to a promise that we will not amend this law, even if it's necessary to protect the public, that is yeah, that is that is our position. I mean, imagine if over the next and it can do this without compensation without compensation for all of the investment that was made at the encouragement of the legislature specifically. It can do it without compensation. That is correct. Wow. That's really I, something. I appreciate that, but understand, let's look at the facts and the law and the fairness, if you will. As a matter of law, this court said in Carney II, I believe it was, that the court, the Commonwealth, bear with me, well, Car Carney too involved uh, the right to uh, a renewal of a license. That's correct. Okay, so but it's not, not a license that has been granted no. at great expense. Agreed. By encouragement of the Commonwealth. Agreed. But what the court said in Carney too is that when someone, when a company or someone participates in a heavily regulated industry, mm -hmm. as gambling indisputably is, the reasonableness of their expectations and their reliance is greatly diminished. Here, as a matter, not so that's the law. The same is true with the facts here. There was com considerable publicity when this law was passed. Within 10 days after its passage, a repeal petition was filed with the Secretary of State. There was publicity around that. There was publicity around the Attorney General's denial to certify that repeal petition to go to the people. And John Rapiro of the Repeal the Casino Deal said, and it was published in many newspapers, we intend to file an initiative petition for 2014 to seek to make ga these forms of gambling illegal. Now, in terms of that license for which Penn National paid $25 million after its award in February of this year. And its cost of application. And its and and but my point is, every single applicant, we're dealing with an extremely sophisticated and well-financed industry here, the, gaming, the gambling industry. And these people have been following this law from the beginning. They know, they have known that this petition was on this table at all times. What has changed since the legislature in 2011 made all of the legislative findings about why this was an important measure for the Commonwealth, for jobs, for development, for tax revenue? What has changed? We don't, dis what has changed, aside from the fact that the economy has gotten better, is that the people have come forward and These said- These jobs don't matter. So whatever the Commonwealth said about the jobs is no longer of relevance because they're- I'm not saying it's not relevant. Rate. What I'm saying is there's a, as the court can see from the perhaps 10 amicus briefs that were filed here, there is a very strong policy disagreement here about what should happen. And that is simply one more reason this matter should go to the voters. In, in so, other states, am I correct that, because I think the, um, uh, Mr. Valvo quotes other states' gaming statutes that specifically say this is not a contract, this is a, it, this. So, so my only point is other states have similar legislation that seems to be, to be somewhat more explicit but doesn't have any concept that it would be a, a violation of the contract clause if, they, if the state were to do what you are suggesting this state can do, correct? I mean, we're not, we're not off on a frolic and detour of our own, out on a limb. Not at all. You'd be following, this, as I said, the Supreme Court's jurisprudence in Stone versus Mississippi. You'd be following this court's jurisprudence throughout the 20th century in terms of distinguishing between core police powers and matters that are outside. Just if... May I just... Uh, I want to make sure that I understand. Uh, your argument dovetails with the Attorney General's as does it not as to the um, situation of a uh, license that's already been granted? Um, and you really are taking a position different than the Attorney General's only as to whether or not there's an implied contract with respect to any applicants. Is that right? Yes. Do you? So in oh, I'm sorry. Please, finish. So in response to Justice Cordy's question about the licenses, your position is really no different than that of the Attorney General. That's correct. Do, what do you say to the argument that has been made that uh, if you prevail, this will have a chilling effect on all businesses in the future that are thinking about 
engaging in activities here in this state. I think that is precisely one of the arguments that the casino industry will make should this go to the ballot as to why this petition should not pass. Uh, I think it is hotly disputed as to whether casino gambling is a good idea or a bad idea. But I think what distinguishes this industry from so many others in terms of the Commonwealth inviting businesses to this state is that this is a heavily regulated industry. There are lots of heavily regulated industries. That's correct. And the question yeah. is whether the police, the police power doesn't trump the Constitution. So if there is a contract here, and if it is impaired, then that's a constitutional problem. If there is a contract here, and if the, we question the Attorney General's analysis, basis for analysis on impairment, and if there is a taking, then yes. But I think the and the police power can't trump that. that otherwise, as, otherwise, as that. we said in Boston Elevated, the implied limitation must have its limits, or the contract and due process, process clauses are gone. I understand that, but it is not a violation of Article 48, even if there is an impairment of contract, if there is no taking. In other words, Article 48 only prohibits a taking of property without just compensation. Not all contracts give rise to the level of property. So, so, not so, all contracts. So, contract. so are you, you, you're, I mean, I'm, I'm playing semantics, but you're saying it's not a, it's not a uh, violation of Article 48 if there's a breach of contract. I mean, if, if impairment of contract and taking mean the same thing, that's on one side, yes. and breach of contract is on the other. That's correct. That's correct. I'd like to get back to the Attorney General's position here because whether there's a contract is, is obviously one of the threshold questions, but the Attorney General needs to jump several hurdles. What the Attorney General has done, aside from saying that a mere applicant who has not paid a license fee of $25 million, as Penn National has done, has greater rights to keep this petition off the ballot, which we think requires checking common sense at the door, but the AG posits the expansion of this Sardella implied contract that was found in the public bidding context. And I think the two contexts are very, very different. One, the Commonwealth is acting in its commercial or proprietary capacity. It is not acting in its sovereign capacity. In reviewing applications for gambling licenses, the Commonwealth is acting in its sovereign capacity. So that's a very significant distinction right there. And we know that outside of the public bidding context, this court has, a, has issued several decisions over the past 25 years, starting with Town of Milton, that says, when a contract is to arise from a statute, the statute must be explicit. And there must also be an explicit waiver of sovereign immunity. Now, in Sardella, the claimant's cl claim arose because it was an alleged violation of a statute. If this petition goes on the ballot and passes, there will be no violation of any statute. Uh, it would be more like as if the public bidding authority said, we're rejecting all bids. And you would say there would be no remedy also, or, or simply that the remedy is one that can be litigated in court. That's right. The attorney general has said there is no remedy. Yeah, you say there is a remedy. I'm saying if, if there is a contract, there is a remedy. The attorney general, we say there's no contract, that there's no reason to expand Sardella, and frankly, I'm not sure why, when we've got this well-established body of case law that talks about what the requirements are for a contract arising from a statute, is that the Attorney General wants to expand the Commonwealth's exposure for these implied contracts. That's frankly surprising. I mean, there's, without suggesting any limiting principle to this doctrine, I mean, query whether the Attorney General is suggesting that every time the government solicits applications for a license, and, the app, and people submit an application and a license fee, that creates a binding contract on the Commonwealth and a waiver of sovereign immunity. Well, ha have we, with regard to other kinds of licensing, liquor licenses, cab licenses, uh, has there been any case which has found that a reduction in the number of those licenses is a taking for those who lose them? Not that I recall. I mean, I do know that there are liquor license cases which say expressly, we can abolish the entire program. And that's what Carney says here. There's no liability when the entire program is abolished 
that authorizes the licensing. There's no suggestion, I mean, the, the interveners talk about revocation of their license. There's no revocation here. No individual license would be taken. There would be an abolition of the program that provides for licensing. One, one, last, one last point I'd like to make. Over the last two weeks, MGM has requested that the, commission, the gaming commission decide that it's gonna get the license in region B but defer issuing it, okay? They've wanted to create it. Now we think the age, this is all hair splitting, and if you read section one of the, of the Commonwealth of the legislation, it says the purpose, uh, ensuring public confidence and integrity of the gaming licensing process, and in the strict oversight of all gaming establishments through a rigorous regulatory scheme is the paramount policy objective. We, we think we can't split hairs. The application and licensing process are all part of one. But if you can split hairs, and the MGM brings this up, our petition would, would allow that, would allow the commission to rule on the applications just as the AG has requested. Section two of our petition. No, your time is up. Thank you. I just direct the court to section two, which allows the commission to rule on applications without issuing licenses. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Carl Valvo. I represent the so-called Ducharme interveners, 22 voters from around the state. Um, I, I want at the outset to respond to Justice Botsford's uh, question about the public, uh, the police power of the legislature to create a public transportation system. My brother, Mr. Bean, says that's sort of at the side of the uh, powers of the uh, government whereas uh, regulating gambling and particularly forbidding gambling is at the core of um, the police power. I would say that uh, in the uh, realm of public policy issues today, uh, as opposed to in 1880, the provision of public transportation in a major urban area is probably at the core of the police power and the ability of the government to do so is undoubted as, as being in the core. But don't you think there's a difference between uh, exercise of the public, uh, of the police power when public morals are at issue, as here, and when public welfare may be at issue, as in transportation? I, I, I was hoping that we had gotten past the point at which the government Ever. regulates uh, public morals. But uh, construing it as the public welfare, uh, yes, of course there's the a police power to regulate the public welfare, but that is, Justice Cordy has suggested, once the Commonwealth has committed itself to engaging in a contract to provide public benefits of a larger order, providing jobs and avoiding the evils that uh, arise from unemployment, uh, economic development and, uh, and uh, avoiding the evils that come from blighted urban areas. These are important uh, uh, exercises of the police power and they deserve uh, some respect. The legislature has balanced them. Uh, there are, uh, this legislation, Chapter 23K, just doesn't say, okay, it's now fine to go out and, and gamble. It is highly regulated, highly controlled, it requires, limited. As I, it requires, as I, as I read it, a very high level of investment as a, as a condition Absolutely. of the license. Absolutely, Your Honor. And, and, uh, for, and the revenue aspects, uh, the um, uh, Penn National uh, licensee will be paying 49% of its gross gaming revenue to the Commonwealth on day one and every day after it begins operation. So let's, let's assume that the, the casino's open and let's assume that it turns out very badly. Let's assume that all of the fears of those who were opposed to casinos come to fruition. It generates very little revenue. Uh, there's an enormous problem with, with those who are suffering from gambling addictions. Everything that those who feared happened did happen. The legislature is now, according to you, prohibited from saying enough's enough, we're gonna end it? 
it's prohibited from unilaterally doing so. I would, under your uh, hypothetical, if things are so bad, it's probable that the licensees would be happy to give up their licenses. Okay, well, let's, let's assume, assume they're, they're not. not. Let's assume they're not. Let's assume they're not. Then the, the Commonwealth would be subject to compensation for the taking of the license. Under your scenario, those licenses would not be valued all that much if everybody's losing money. But let's assume it's making a lot of money for the casinos, but it's it's causing the state a great deal of harm. You're saying the state would have to pay state potentially can, billions the, of dollars for lost profits as a result of this taking? The state can uh, exercise its police power in controlling um, unforeseen uh, or de developments that affect the public welfare. So for example, if um, the operation of the casinos uh, generated some un unforeseen environmental problem, the legislature would be free to regulate in a way that might even increase the uh, burden, the regulatory burden on the licensee, reduce its profitability, but nonetheless, it would, the legislature would be free as the 1960 uh, opinion of the justices contemplates, uh, regulating around the edges of the core inducement, which is here you get a a license for a term of years, subject not at the pleasure of the Commonwealth. So if so, Everything else that's ancillary to the operation of a casino would be so open for so by that, by that logic, if a town decides to go dry and decides to end the sale of liquor in the town, it would be a taking with no, regard to all those No, it wouldn't because the legislature licenses? has installed language in the liquor license law that specifically uh, precludes a determination that the liquor license it creates a property interest. Well, Mr. So Mr. Sachs is going to say, Mr. Sachs is going to say that that same language is in this legislation. If it is, I haven't seen it. So uh, you, you would say to, to my question to Mr. Bean that it really is a big difference and, and, and companies in New Jersey or I don't know where, I, I forget which ones you meant, maybe it was New Jersey, um, uh, they invest with their eyes open. And if the legislature in New Jersey were to say, ah, we don't like this anymore, or if the people, if they have an initiative petition, I don't know if they do, but if they do, if the people were to say, we don't want this anymore, that's too bad for them. But here, because we don't have that language in our statute, it's a, it's a completely different ballgame? Well, we don't have the language in the statute, and it's, I say, by intention, because on every other statute that uses the term revocable privilege also says, but this shall not be a property interest. Ours does not say that. But to answer, not every state has uh, an initiative. When the legislature uh, enacts a statute that creates a, uh, and under the Boston Elevated analysis, a what we would call a statutory contract, companies who respond to the inducements of those states can rely on the uh, state keeping its promises. The problem here is that the legislature and the governor are both firmly committed to this uh, legislation as a way of achieving enormously important public goods. There is no question that the legislature is uh, uh, supporting the, the legislation it enacted over a period of four years. It's the, it's the fact no that the There's no question that the legislature is elected by the people, right? And they were reelected. Okay, but I, I mean, are you saying that, that the legislature, the, the, it really does make a difference that this is an initiative petition because the governor and the legislature don't agree? It makes a difference that it's an initiative petition because um, in okay. the ordinary course, if there were a taking, there would be compensation in, uh, to, in payment for the property taken. Now, it could be very little money if under some scenarios that the gaming business is not doing well, but it, could, it might not be. The problem with an initiative is that if it's inconsistent with taking, there's no mechanism in a, an initiative to provide the payment mechanism for the, compens the just compensation. So, so you would say there you have the problem in, as in Domino. So, so you would say that clearly the legislature can go back on this 
if it chooses, it simply would be a taking, Absolutely. which would require compensation, which is sort of what the Constitution Absolutely. requires when property That's is taken. That's what a taking the always is. Right. Uh, when the, the government decides to build a road uh, through my living room, it decides that the public interest requires that road. Fine, it takes my living room, but I get paid for it. That's a taking. And what you're, the problem here, as, I, as you suggest, is that you actually couldn't even include, or could you include, a provision for compensation in an initiative petition? I don't believe so, because it precludes appropriating money. Right. And you would say, so a provision that said, and the applicants shall be compensated accordingly would violate the initiative petition as well. Right. That's essentially what happened in Domino, and this court decided that uh, that mechanism didn't meet the ready payment uh, criterion for an effective payment uh, mechanism for a taking. I'd like to address this. So not, even if the initiative petition was drafted differently uh, to permit compensation, it wouldn't pass muster, in your view. <clears throat> I might try it, but I, I don't think it would succeed because to the extent that it would uh, commit the payment of uh, public monies for a particular purpose, it would probably amount to an appropriation. If I could turn you to the relatedness issue briefly. Uh, you say that the paramutual, uh, the, 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 the bar on dog racing paramutual betting is separate and apart and therefore not related to the ban on the casinos, or at least the prohibition with regard to the casinos. Isn't, isn't, isn't there a relatedness in that we are essentially, this, this, this referendum would essentially go back to the old days where there was the traditional gambling, horse racing, charities, lottery. Is that not a relatedness well, that's sufficient? The, the question, uh, the relatedness question posed by uh, my clients is essentially what does Carney one mean. Um, we could go back to a time when we merely decided, are these two subjects germane to, to some common purpose? If that were the, the standard, I would agree. They both relate to gambling. Okay, fine. That would render the relatedness uh, requirement essentially meaningless, because anyone could uh, probably meet that. It would be, you'd have to work hard to, to not meet it. What I'm uh, arguing in, uh, as to relatedness is that Carney 1 says that the two subjects have to be operationally related to each other so as to provide a common or unified statement of public policy. And further, that the, that the Attorney General and the court is to look at the real world, including the history, of how this would actually have an impact at the ballot box. So it's not so much what was the history back in before 1930s when greyhound racing was legalized. It's what would people in November 2014 see as the unifying uh, public policy here. And we say that the, uh, for, under that standard, a reasonable voter doesn't consider the uh, problems posed by uh, gaming uh, to be anywhere like the, whatever problems are posed by greyhound racing, especially greyhound racing in other states. Uh, I, I would just like to give you one site. <laughs> I didn't get to the uh, uh, objection based on the reserve powers doctrine, but I refer the court to the Windstar case, 518 U.S. 839, uh, cited by the plaintiffs and the defendants, and with respect to the public, to the reserve powers doctrine, the uh, seven justices, four uh, uh, in an opinion by Justice Souter and three by an opinion by Justice Scalia, reject the uh, reserve powers doctrine as uh, standing in the way of uh, compensating for the uh, violation of a contract in which the government induced reliance. Thank you. Thank you counsel. Good morning, Your Honors. Peter Sachs for the Attorney General and Secretary. I'd like to start by addressing Justice Cordy's question about whether um, this would be an instance of the police power trumping the Constitution. The police power source is in the Constitution itself. Uh, in Massachusetts, it's Part 2, Chapter 2, Section 1, Article 4, which gives the legislature 
uh, a broad variety of powers to legislate in favor of the, or to protect the public welfare. So it wouldn't be a question here of um, the police power trumping the Constitution, but if the legislature were allowed to bargain away the police power, that would undermine the constitutional scheme by allowing one legislature to bind its successors or to bind the people in their exercise of their power under Article So there is no limitation on the police power. None well, of the other protections in the Constitution are of value as long as the Commonwealth says it's exercising its police power? No, and that's the, um, the distinction that the courts have occasionally, including this court, have occasionally struggled with about what are the bounds of the police power. Uh, the 1960s certainly can't opinion. be unlimited. No, surely the, not. The, this the whole court, point of a constitution. That's right, and the um, the uh, Supreme Court has recognized in U.S. Trust, for example, they've given a nice little catalog of what powers are uh, can and cannot be um, bargained away. Uh, the the, pow the state certainly has the power to enter into binding purely financial contracts. That is to pay its debts. Um, and a franchise, presumably a franchise to build and operate a public transportation system? Well, the portion of the, that contract, that franchise that would secure payment of bonds by revenues from the system would be permissible. But as the court said in U.S. Trust, and this is in footnote 7 of our reply brief, um, not every security provision in a bond is necessarily financial. For example, a revenue bond might be secured by a state's promise to continue operating the facility in question. Yet such a promise surely could not validly be construed to bind the state never to close the facility for health or safety reasons. What we're so, talking about, we're not talking about never here, we're talking about an exclusive, limited in time, license subject to an enormous number of conditions, and surely subject to the police power, at least at the margins, as opposed to at the core. Well, 15 years is limited in one sense. Five but years, a, we a, have first, first a, license. Five years for a slots license, but the same theory here applies to 15 years for a casino license, and the, the interveners characterize that as modest. Um, whether the court chooses to accept that characterization is, is obviously let, for let the me, court. But the question in, in Stone and many subsequent um, decisions, or I shouldn't say it's a question, it was answered by Stone, is can the contract be entered into in the first place? And this is addressed at pages uh, four through six uh, of our reply brief. Stone said, the first inquiry in this class of cases is whether a contract has in fact been entered into. Uh, the court, Supreme Court said in Douglas versus Kentucky, an 1897 case, a lottery grant is not in any sense a contract, but simply a gratuity and license which the state under its police powers and for the protection of the public morals may at any time revoke. And again, in U.S. Trust, the court said, the Supreme Court can said. It can it revoke it in, in the circumstances where, as a condition of the license for X number of years, uh, in hundreds of millions of dollars of investment were required? Can it revoke it without compensation? I guess that's my question. Yes, because the grant conferred no property right to begin with. So no property right, no compensation. Whether that, whether that property right is, is argued to inherit in the license or to constitute part of a contract between the state. The state has no power to enter a contract or to grant a license that promises not to surrender the police power at any time in the future. And you would say, I think agree with Mr. Bean as to Chief Justice Ireland's question, that to the extent that, that you know, um, uh, puts us under a black cloud, a sort of Taxachusetts in another um, uh, iteration. Uh, that's a political question, and that, would, that is what would be debated. Yes. Can I ask you this? Is it your position that an initiative petition could not have been filed even if it – or certified – even if it concluded or included a compensation clause? Uh, a compensation clause would almost certainly be inconsistent with the prohibition on specific appropriations. So this is not a subject for initiative petition? Well, um, on the Attorney General's theory for disapproving this petition, and, and I hope it's clear that the Attorney General, since we agree with the petition sponsors on some issues and the petition opponents on others, the role of the Attorney General is merely to apply the rules of Article 48 and not to either advance or, or – um, obstruct the uh, development of expanded gaming on no, the that, That's under, understood, but under your view that you say this is inadequate doesn't pass 
muster because it doesn't include a compensation clause, but on the other hand, it couldn't have. So therefore, an initiative petition couldn't have been filed in any of it. No, it could have been. Um, the problem with this petition is that it precludes the uh, commission from issuing decisions on license applications. And Mr. Bean referred at the close of his argument to section two of the proposed law um, as saying that the commission could in fact issue decisions without issuing app, uh, licenses as uh, MGM has requested. What section two says is notwithstanding any other law, um, illegal gaming including casinos and slots and pure mutual wagering on simulcast greyhound racing shall be prohibited and the commission is hereby prohibited from approving any application or request therefore. So our interpretation of that language is that the commission cannot proceed to make decisions on applications without issuing licenses. Help me to understand the distinction that you are drawing. Uh, if a casino license is granted and if millions of dollars are invested, your position is that there is no property right if the state were to decide that they want to end that, correct? Yes. But you're saying there is a contract right in order to get a decision from the casino board as to whether to proceed, even though the only purpose for obtaining that approval is to build a casino? Well, it's not the only purpose. Certainly it was the chief purpose of the applicants. Um, they weren't merely paying their millions of dollars for um, a commission seal of approval on their applications. What they wanted was a 15-year casino license or a five-year slots part of the license. But the um, legislature and the commission have no power to grant that in a way that's binding on subsequent legislatures or on the people. What they can get and what would still have value to them as conceded in the plaintiff's brief is a decision on their application. And plaintiffs say uh, applicants that the commission finds suitable have thereby received a benefit from them, regardless of whether they ultimately receive a license. The rigorous nature of the commission's suitability investigations, which include staff reports that typically are hundreds of pages long, and commission determinations typically based upon adjudicatory hearings, make the suitability determination a potentially very valuable reference and selling point to an applicant seeking to operate gaming establishments elsewhere. But and I'd refer the court to footnote 23 of my brief, which sets out many, many different criteria that a uh, uh, licensee uh, should endeavor to satisfy to obtain a license, including what kind of synergies they can develop with the local economy, what will they will do in terms of workforce development, um, contracting with minority women and business uh, veterans business enterprises, energy efficiency, dealing with the, the, what the legislature calls the problem of compulsive gambling in the text of chap chapter 23K. So these kinds of decisions um, determining which is the best of the applicants can be valuable to um, the applicants. It's certainly not the main goal, but it's They're the most the common They're paying a lot of wealth. money for that, aren't they? They are, but uh, they can't get a license uh, in a way that <laughs> is immune from later uh, repeal by the legislature or the people under uh, under uh, the reserve police but powers. Why do they have a contractual entitlement to that decision if, if, when they get that decision, they have no remedy if the decision is arbitrary? Well. The, the greater power to deny or, or to repeal the license itself does not necessarily include the lesser power to uh, call off the commission's statutory and regulatory obligation to issue detailed decisions on all of these applications. Is it possible so, that, uh, I can't remember the dates, but if the schedule stays as it is currently envisioned, is it possible, uh, as, as the um, uh, Mr. Bean says, that all four of these, that is the, the slots license and the other three will be issued before this, before December 4th? No, because Region C, the southeastern region, currently has a projected award date of February 2015. And of course, there's some uncertainty over uh, Region A, the uh, eastern region involving Boston, with a um, dispute over whether Boston is a host community, um, either with respect to Everett or Revere. And the projected award date there is um, no earlier than August or uh, 60 to 90 days or more afterwards. That's the latest projection from the commissioner that I'm aware of. Um, so no, there's no, uh, under the commission's current schedule, there appears to be no chance that this um, 
that the uh, Attorney General's reason for disapproving the petition would be moot before the election. I did want to come back very briefly to the question of whether the petition could have been drafted differently in a way that would, would have allowed it to go on the ballot. If the commission, I mean, if the um, petition had been drafted to allow uh, decisions on applications without prohibiting, uh, while still prohibiting issuances of licenses themselves, that would have been permissible. And while I don't think um, anyone was focused on it at the time, the record contains uh, the proponent's submission of a draft petition to the Attorney General back in July of 2013 for our comment. Uh, and again, while neither we nor the proponents were focused on this implied contract issue at the time, we suggested that the uh, petition be phrased in a more straightforward manner that actually would have avoided this issue by simply saying, um, the, notwithstanding any other law to the contrary, the commission shall not issue any license allowing the operation of the casino. Oh. Now, the, the way that the, but the um, proponents stuck to their original phrasing, which uh, precludes the commission from acting on, uh, I'm sorry, is it allowing any application, therefore? Prohibited approving, from accepting approving approving. any application, therefore. And that uh, language appears to preclude the, the commission from um, issuing, from approving an application without issuing a license. Is your, your argument, given your view of the police power and the inability to limit it in the sense of if a license is issued, the legislature or the people could basically um, say, no, it's not going to happen. Do you depend on something in 23K that m makes a, a very clear demarcation between the application process and the license process? No. I mean, I don't understand no. why the greater doesn't take care of the lesser in your argument. Are you asking about why we disagree with the intervener's theory or why we... Well, what I'm asking is since you, since you do disagree with the Ducharme view that um, uh, the legislature yes. or the people could not, um, uh, without violating, without doing a yes. taking, since, since that's your position and, and it rests on this core police power, why doesn't the application process sort of fall within that? Because uh, the commission issuing a decision on who issued the best application doesn't threaten the public health, safety, welfare, or morals but, in a way that at least the proponents of the petition contend gambling itself would. But the that, commission but that, issuing okay, a decision doesn't uh, threaten the exercise or uh, of the Commonwealth's core police powers. So it's a written decision, much like, and I would commend the court's uh, attention to the uh, decision on the slot parlor application, which is referenced in uh, footnote 52 of our brief, um, where the commission goes through the three surviving applicants for the slots parlor and um, goes through a very careful comparison of how they uh, meet or do not meet the various licensing cr criteria set forth in the statute and ends up determining that uh, SGR or Penn National, as it's also known, is the, is the winning applicant. So but that doesn't, that issuance of that decision doesn't itself threaten the, the uh, public health, safety, welfare, or morals in a way that the petitioners contend gambling itself would do. The so-called implied contract that you describe, does it require a prompt decision? Can they sue if the casino board delays it indefinitely? Um, that's a question of mandamus law. I suppose... Uh, that's possible, but I think it's a moot question here because the, the uh, casino, the, the uh, gaming commission has shown no inclination that I'm aware of or that any of the parties have alleged to slow this process well, down. I understand that. Quite but, to but the contrary, they're trying to move forward to right. implement their yeah, statutory and, mandate. And no, no one's questioning their good faith, but this theory that you're suggesting to invite an implied contract, where does it end? I mean, if there's an implied contract here, don't you open the door to implied contracts in matters where there's a much greater risk of, of, uh, of contractual harm to the Commonwealth? Well, the limiting principle here, um, and in the public bid bidding context, but in very few other contexts, it th is there is no other effective remedy for um, failure to follow the statutory process. In this instance, it wouldn't be the Commission's fault, because the Commission would be precluded by the proposed law from following it. But um, in other I mean, what makes this situation unique, we're, we're competing for a very small number of highly discretionary licenses. 
applicants have paid many millions of dollars for decisions on their applications. They're, are, they're entitled by statute and regulation to detailed decisions on their applications. And, and you'll see from the slots parlor uh, decision that it's not merely a grant of um, the application of Penn National, also known as Springfield Gaming and Redevelopment, but it's a denial of the applications of the other. So it goes through all three applications and explains why the commission is deciding as it did on each. But the other important thing here is that Chapter 23 Gay does explicitly uh, prohibit judicial review of the commission's denial of applications. So that's why, in this context, um, the, implied remit the implied contract uh, by which the commission is going to carry through its process uh, is necessary to um, ensure that the commission does so, much as in the public bidding context. In most other contexts for license applications, there's either judicial review available um, or those other distinguishing features, the highly discretionary nature, um, the payment of many millions of dollars, the detailed decisions on all applications being required by law. Those elements are absent. So we do not believe that this opens up the Commonwealth to a um, vast new uh, area of claims of implied contracts. But what if, and what if the initiative ended the, the board? What, what if the initiative had eliminated the body which was going to make this decision? Same, same result under the Attorney General's basis for disapproving the, the petition. The petitioners paid the money to get decisions on their applications, abolishing the, the commission that was supposed to issue those applications um, is not uh, distinguishable in principle from saying the commission can't issue decisions. But I, I'm still confused by, um, uh, it, it would seem to me that you're, to make the distinction you make between the application process and the license process in terms of uh, what rights it does or doesn't um, give to the applicant or the licensee, um, I would think that there would have to be something in the legislation itself that that draws a bright line there. But if, because why wouldn't one normally read this as, as the application process is simply um, uh, a very connected means to the end, that is the license, and it is all governed by this core police power? Well, it is all a means to an end, but it, it is also something, as plaintiffs themselves concede, um, where mere decisions on applications can have value to the applicants apart from the licenses themselves. And so, an I issuance get that, of those but decisions... The, but if the legislation doesn't sort of say, we see these as separate things, I mean, doesn't that go to legislative intent or not? The question is, as in the public bidding context, what kind of remedy should be implied to ensure that the Commonwealth carries through with its part of the... But in the, the public the bidding context, as I read that, the 121A, I think it is, or whatever the statute is, th there was actually a very specific provision that the Bridgewater or whomever uh, housing authority violated, correct? I believe so. But um, the commission, uh, let me be clear, retains the discretion under Chapter 23K to reject all of the applications, just as in the public bidding context ordinarily, the awarding authority retains the discretion to reject all bids. But that doesn't mean the, that the um, procurement process can be just canceled in the middle after everyone has invested a substantial amount of money in it. And um, to, to paraphrase one of the justices earlier, the Commonwealth or the awarding authority says, never mind. In this case, while the uh, petitioners, or excuse me, while the applicants have no implied contract under which they could get or keep licenses to engage in gaming for five years or 15 years, um, they do have an implied contract that entitles them to these decisions, which could be of some value to them. Mr. Sachs, let's assume uh, that we ultimately disagree with you and allow the matter to go on the ballot, um, and it passes, and the licenses for the other gaming uh, facilities have not been issued. Uh, would the Commonwealth be subject to liability in those circumstances, suit by those individuals who applied but didn't have rulings on there? Well, Your Honor, um, while this is not in the record, I, I don't believe any of the parties will disagree with me because they've seen the materials. Um, this theory of the implied contract for a decision on applications was not one that the Attorney General invented. This was one that was asserted to us by representatives of the gaming industry 
last August during our review of the petition, and one that we were ultimately persuaded by, although conceitedly it's a close case and, and the analogy to the public bidding context isn't, uh, isn't perfect. So yes, if this proposed law passes, then I, I don't see what would protect the Commonwealth against that kind of suit. And at stake might be what? Certainly all the monies that were expended in the licensing process. Well, not all of the monies that were uh, expended in the licensing process in the sense that those who obtained uh, negative suitability determinations um, got what they paid for under the Attorney General's view of the case. Um, those who obtained positive determinations but nevertheless didn't get the final license, as with two out of the three slots parlor applicants, um, got what they paid for. Um, so it would be only those applicants who uh, still had applications pending uh, who hadn't uh, received a decision on the, the phase of the application process that they were in. So it would be both the money that they paid, which I think still would probably calculate into the millions, plus bid preparation costs, so to speak? Well, we don't think that the, the um, bid preparation costs is necessary in this context. It, it is in the Sardella public bidding context because one ordinarily doesn't pay a large fee or even any fee to government in order to participate. Um, the question is what kind of remedy is necessary to incentivize compliance with the contract, with the public bidding process, and to offer some compensation to bidders if they are injured by non-compliance. In the public bidding context, that's bid preparation costs because there aren't direct payments. Here there are direct payments to the Commission, so we contend that those would be a sufficient remedy. All right, we have to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Your Honor.